Hello and welcome back to yet another season of The Scoop, recorded live in the studios at Saddleback College here in beautiful Mission Viejo. I'm your new host, Evan Anderson. I'm very excited to be hosting The Scoop this season. We're going to do a lot of really fun stuff here in the studio and learn about stories going all around Orange County. We have an excellent crew that's put in a lot of effort to make this show great and entertaining. So without any further ado, let's get the show on the road. Now today's show is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to sit down with the school's technical service librarian, have a chef whip us up something to eat here in studio, and talk with the director here at Saddleback, who currently has a film in the Newport Film Festival, and that's not even everything. But before we get to any of that, let's get caught up in some local Saddleback news and see what the campus has been up to. Last week, your Saddleback men's basketball team finished off their regular season in a way they've become quite used to. They blew out Orange Coast College with a 78-43 win. With that, they won their fifth straight Orange Empire Conference championship and secured the number one seed in the California state rankings. The Gauchos are already defending state champions and on their way to grabbing another title. The team is led by head coach Andy Brown, who had his 200th career win this season and has three state championships here at Saddleback. We sat down with him and got some insight on what it's like having to defend the title. We're going to get everybody's best shot, and they're going to play to the level of their competition, which is pretty good, and so we're going to get their best shot. And it's happened many times, especially in league. Uh, all league games are... Uh, very close for the most part because we have a lot of good coaches and they've studied the 24 games now or 23 games or 20 games until they play us, you know, with what we've done, our personnel, and so they've done a good job matching up and, and things like that. The Gauchos did have some close games this season, especially in conference play against teams like Fullerton, but they always found a way to push through, finishing 12-0 in the Orange Empire Conference. The team is 27-1 and overall and currently on a 21-game win streak. How can one team be so dominant? First of all, they're, they're talented guys. We have a talented team, and uh, it's not a one-man team. It's, we have 15 very good players, and it's uh, tough getting them all playing time, but uh, they've all done a good job uh, at accepting their roles, and uh, that's why we've had success. The regional playoffs have begun, and if the Gauchos keep playing with such force, they'll make their way to the state tournament in San Jose starting March 11th. From scoring points on the hardwood to scoring points with the judges, Saddleback students came out last week to audition for the Saddleback Star Vocal Competition. We had all types of vocal performers, from rap, to international opera. Every student that showed up to the audition had to fill out a quick questionnaire, then had the opportunity to sing for the judges. The competition will be held this Thursday, March 3rd, in the McKinney Theater here at Saddleback. Tickets are only $5, so make sure you come out and see who is crowned the Saddleback Star of 2016. It's amazing how much talent the students here possess. Our team also just had a big win, win their last game, and they play again soon, so fingers crossed for the hot streak to continue. Now, let's move right along. Every college has a library, and Saddleback is very lucky to have a good one. We're sitting down with the librarian, over to you, Bill. Thanks, Evan. We're pleased today to have as our guest on College Talk, Lydia Wilhan. Lydia is a technical services librarian at the Saddleback College Library. Lydia, thanks for being with us here today. Well, thank you for having me. You're so welcome. Let's start out, tell us a little bit about yourself and why did you choose to be a librarian? All right, well, um, I'm the technical services librarian here at Saddleback. I've been here for about four years. And I went into the library profession because I wanted uh, to help people. I wanted to have a profession where I felt like I was making a difference in people's lives. Uh -huh. And being in connection with students and everything. Definitely, yes. It gives me an opportunity every day to connect with students. Oh, you're in a great spot. 
Now tell us about this Library 100 class that students can take here at Saddleback College. Yeah, so Library 100 is a, a one unit course fully online for eight weeks. And it's really a, a basic foundations course that build, builds the basic skills that students need to be success, successful at doing college level research. So looking at how to find information and how to use it properly. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we also offer a Library 2 course, which is available um, as an honors class. And that digs in a little bit deeper on those basic foundational skills. Uh -huh. So there's a couple of levels of yes, learning definitely. when you learn the library. There's a lot to learn. There is a lot to learn. Awesome. Why is it that you believe that libraries are so important to an education, all the way from grade school through college? Yeah, definitely. Uh, libraries, they're critical for student success at any level. I mean, from kindergarten all the way through PhD level. Um, it's easy, I think, for people to think today that, oh, why do you need libraries? Everything's on Google, it's online, and it's for free. Uh, but the reality is that the type of resources that you need to do rigorous scholarly research is not available for free from a Google search. And so the library spends hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to make those resources available to students. Mm. Well, what are some of the uh, resources that students have, including the things that might not be so obvious in the library? Yeah, well, one thing to keep in mind is that when you come to our library, what you see on the shelf is really only about a third of our entire collection. The other two thirds are only available online. Oh. So ebooks, uh, journal articles, they're all available online. Um, but that's not to say that we don't still add print materials to our collection. Um, one of our most popular resources is our textbook reserve program, which is where the library purchases the textbooks that are used in Saddleback classes. And we make them available to students, usually for about two hours at a time. And that's a great resource because textbooks are extremely expensive and it's a great burden on our students. And so we um, take that upon ourselves to make those available to students. Mm -hmm. What are the benefits then of having this online library for students to be able to access all these resources? Yeah, well, when you look at the number of online courses that we offer at Saddleback, it really, we really need to offer all of our services online because we have students who take classes who may never step foot on Saddleback on, on our campus. So we need to make those resources available online. But when we do that, we're really helping all students. Um, students are, you know, they're, they're busy like everyone else. And so they don't always have time to come to the library when we're physically open. But by having um, resources available online and services online, um, it really, it helps everyone. So you might be working on a research paper um, and you have a question about how to find information, but you don't have time to drive all the way to campus and find a parking spot and mm -hmm. deal with that. So you can just hop online and chat with a librarian right there at home, or you can take a library workshop at home. So they're really, it, it's a, it benefits everyone to have our services online. And that is awesome. Technolo technology has really changed libraries in a positive way. Yes, definitely. Um, it's also added some new challenges, though. There's so much information available to people now because of the internet. And it, it's really up to each and every one of us to evaluate all the information that we read, which um, creates a burden for the students, but mm -hmm. um, it's, it's definitely a fun challenge. Well, Lydia, thank you for coming in to talk with us today about that very interesting story. We appreciate that. And students, check out those library resources available to you. Evan, back to you in the studio. Thank you, Bill. And a very special thank you to Lydia Wellen for taking time out of her busy schedule to come down and sit with us. The library is located in the LRC building if you're interested in checking it out. Also, check out the school's course catalog for all the courses they offer. Now it's time to take a quick break. When we get back, we're going to do some cooking. Saddleback College enriches its students and the South Orange County community by providing a comprehensive array of high-quality courses and programs. We foster student learning and success in the attainment of academic degrees and career technical certificates, transfer to four-year institutions, and improvement of basic skills. We dedicate ourselves to excellence in academics, student support, and community service. 
We hope Saddleback College will be your first choice. Welcome back, everyone. Now I know what you're all thinking. Wow, that boy really needs to get some meat on his bones. Well, we're in luck. Just so happens that we're joined today by Chef Randy Gubala, who's gonna do a little cooking for us on the show today. She's over with Andrea right now, so let's not waste any time. Take it away, Andrea. Thank you, Evan. I'm here with Chef Randy Gubala out of Atlanta, Georgia, who was a 14-year demonstration cook. Hi, Randy, thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me here today. So what are we gonna be cooking and teaching everybody at home? We are going to make pesto, and I'm gonna show you students um, an economical, easy way to make it. And it's wonderful because pesto is good with everything. It's good for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. Awesome. Appetizers. So where do we start? Well, What's the first pesto ingredient. The first thing I do is I take two cloves of garlic and I put them down the feed tube. And I just run the machine okay. and let them chop. Okay. Then I add two cups of cleaned basil and I use basil from a plant like that. So you just go and rip this tree out of the ground exactly. and we're all good? Exactly. And wash the leaves very carefully and do two cups of basil and then you add a cup of Parmesan cheese. Now this recipe is a little different from the original in that an original recipe would have pine nuts and less Parmesan. So these right here. Exactly. Pine nuts. But we're not using these today? No. Pine nuts are expensive, right? They're very expensive, and I actually find that it freezes better without the pine nuts. So we're going to freeze this too? So I want to make this economical so college students can afford to make this. Perfect. I am a little broke. <laughs> Books and all that, you yes. know. It... I know. I have two daughters who went through college. Oh, so you know all about yes. cheap cooking. Exactly. So what made you get into cooking? Well, I got married and I couldn't <laughs> boil water and it was pretty bad. So I decided to start taking some cooking classes. So he and wasn't a cooker either then? <laughs> well, he was, but he just didn't cook. <laughs> okay, but, um, okay, so now I'm gonna add the oil. Okay. So what you do, as you're putting the stuff in the Cuisinart, first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna put the two cloves of garlic and then you're gonna add the basil, pulse it, add the Parmesan cheese, and then turn the machine on. It's gonna do this. So just slowly adding it in yes. as the machine's going? Yes. Until it's just all done? Mm -hmm. Okay, look at that color, it's getting a lot lighter. Mm -hmm. Is that because of the oil making it lighter and the cheese? Well, it's incorporating everything. It's kind of like a slow, steady stream as a way of making a mayonnaise. So it's just incorporating all the ingredients. Okay. Oh, you can already smell it. Too bad all these cameras don't have any smell on them because I know people at home would love this. So I'm just checking it for color. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Consistency. Very beautiful. Oh, he's it's got a beautiful green color. Oh, that smell. <laughs> and then the I'm just gonna. That was amazing. And so it if, like uh, say I didn't want to use spinach, could I use, like, I'm an arugula junkie. I like that yes. peppery green. Could I do an arugula Arugula pesto? actually makes fantastic pesto. Oh, good but when you make arugula, I would go ahead and use nuts. And one thing I wanted to tell you is you don't always have to use pine nuts. You can use walnuts. I have a lot of friends who make, in fact, one of my um, good friends who's an Italian chef, she always makes her pesto with walnuts, and then her trick is she puts in a squeeze of lemon juice. Oh. And so that's kind of fun, too. In the classic Italian way, so she knows what um, she's talking about. Well, the about. classic Italian way is actually not doing it oh, that way. Oh, it's not with lemon. No. Okay, so it's just the, the her Italian, Italian twist. The classic Italian way would be for you to get the motor and pestle and put a little salt in here, and then a clove of garlic, and then you would mash it, and as you're mashing it, then you would take your basil leaves and start pounding them. Then you would add some pine nuts and, then the, and some olive oil. And the last thing you would add would be the cheese. So that okay. would be the last thing that you would do. So if you want to get just, traditional, exactly. you get one of these babies. And there's still some chefs out there today who, and 
who love to do it like this. I, get, I think it kind of, they can beat something out. It makes them feel good. But that's Take out the, the stress, traditional. leave it all exactly. in the pesto. Exactly. And hey, us students studying, studying yes. and have a lot of pressure. I might need one of these babies. <laughs> now, the, the reason I like this particular recipe for pesto is when it's done, you can either spoon it into a jar like this. A little mason jar kind a little of. Ma uh, a little jam jar. Actually, leftover jar from, um, from jam, right? <laughs> from the jam. Or yeah. you can actually, and then put it a, a small film of oil and then stick it in the fridge. Perfect. But not, you can just do it this way which is great because this is what I do, is I spoon it into ice cube trays. Ice cube tray? You spoon it or into what? an ice cube tray. You're going to freeze your pesto. Yes. You freeze your pesto and it's fantastic. You can freeze the pesto to mm -hmm. use it for any other time? Yes. So what you're going to do is you're going to just what? spoon it into your ice cube tray. Oh, look at that green color. And you don't need to put a cover of olive oil. Like if you were storing it in the refrigerator in the jar, you would put a little bit of olive oil to protect it from turning brown. For quick use? For quick use. Okay. I would say three to four days. So if I'm going to be doing something with my pesto, let's say adding it to pasta salad or something like that. OK, so this is what I do. And so I would just, just fill them up all the way is fine? Fill them up all the way because it's easier to pop out. OK. So and then when you do that, it comes out looking like this frozen and it literally just takes a few uh, about five to ten minutes to defrost frozen cube. so if you know you're going to use it that morning or whatever just pop it out in the morning about five or ten minutes later you have pesto Perfect. but a great thing to do with pesto is to put it on brie oh it's fabulous on brie, brie. or some like I'm a goat cheese person so I could goat cheese it up you could goat cheese it perfect you could do it with fresh mozzarella what I do with this is sometimes I put it in the oven and melt it. You could put the brie right on it. A little brie pesto bake. If you've got company, you found out you got company, always keep like a baguette in your house, have pesto in your freezer, have brie in the drawer or some kind of cheese. And if somebody drops by, you can throw together an appetizer real quick. Perfect. This is another thing I do with pesto is I add pesto to my pasta salad with grilled chicken. Awesome. And you can also do that when you're... Oh, that looks so good. Instead of mayonnaise, you can always use pesto. Yeah, I hate mayo. A nice smear of pesto on a on sandwich. sandwich. Turkey, exactly. chicken, veggie. So just spoon it, it in. Everything. Any kind of pasta salad, instead of using mayonnaise, there's no mayonnaise in here, I just use pesto. Oh. And it's, it's really healthy. It's a lot healthier, yeah. It's a lot healthier. It's just vegetables. Any kind of pasta that you want, any shape you want. I like these big curly cues. Yeah, no, it makes the presentation really nice. Awesome. So we're finishing up here, but I really uh -huh. want to thank you, Randy, for coming and joining us because this is amazing. I hope you all learned a little something different. We're going to eat now. So sorry. Uh, hopefully Evan might be able to come over and join us in a little oh. bit. Maybe he won't, here, but I'm going to eat. Try some of that. I'm going to get some of this. Take a bite. Back to you, Evan. That looks absolutely delicious. We're going to take another quick break while I run over there and get some of that pesto. But stay tuned, we have some more exciting stories for you coming up. I'm Evan Anderson with The Scoop, and we'll be right back. We hope Saddleback College will be your first choice if you seek a dynamic, innovative, and student-centered post-secondary education. Welcome back to The Scoop. Next up, we have our Saddleback Showcase Spotlight, where we'll introduce you to one of the Saddleback's own filmmakers. Zoe Carpenter is the director of a short film called Never Ever Give Up. It's about what one girl did to help others 
while battling cancer. Here it is. The Nigu Foundation is about a girl, Jessie Reese, that passed away in 2012 from cancer. And I was interested in this project back then when I heard about it. I heard about Jessie just around the time when she had passed away because I saw a news article and I googled it and I, that's how I found out about it. So basically what the foundation does is before Jessie passed away, she would go to hospital and come out and she had a wish to help all the other kids that were fighting cancer that didn't get to go home. So that's basically what she told her dad. So before she, she passed away, she started stuffing Joy Jazz with little toys and they would send them out to children's hospitals all over the country. So in 2012, when I was going back home to Zimbabwe, which is where I'm from, I reached out to the foundation and told them that I wanted to take some Joy Jazz to Zimbabwe. So they packed some Joy Jazz for me and I took them back home to Zimbabwe. So fast forward a few years later, when we were doing a project at school, it was really important for me to do the Jesse Rees Foundation because I thought that was a really touching story. It was difficult because I didn't quite know how to ask certain questions because then I felt, am I being insensitive? Because when you're interviewing somebody, you want to get information, but then there's just certain questions that came across to me, like if I asked him this question, would it put him in a bad space? Because it is a very sensitive topic, talking about a child that passed away. So it really was hard for me to sit and try and ask him questions about Jesse. But then he was very happy to talk about her, like anything. It's like he brought up stuff himself. The other thing that amazed me about working on this project is just how many young people were involved. For example, the coordinator, Corey, he's like, I believe he was, he's 22 years old. So it was really uh, amazing to see how young people could come together and work for a good cause. Because sometimes you think uh, causes like cancer, only older generations are working on it. But there were a lot of young people that were working in different aspects of the Nigu Foundation. So that was impressive to me. Jess's story has definitely affected me in the sense that I look around me and I think there's so many things that we take for granted because when I hear the story of how they were walking one day and she started getting blurry vision and they took her to the doctor and then they found out that, you know, she had the cancer, to me it just reminds us every day as we walk around that, you know, anything could be happening that's about to change the rest of our lives. So I tend to, especially with my kids, you know, appreciate them and just be thankful that everything is okay for the day. Never Ever Give Up will be featured in a college showcase at the Newport Beach Film Festival held during the last week of April. It really is an amazing accomplishment. So again, a special thank you to Zoe Carpenter for showing us her film. Now, we have time for one more story. It's one that I personally got to work on and had a lot of fun doing. It's about the California Great Park in Irvine and all the attractions that it has to offer. So, with that, Enjoy the story, and over to you, me. What's that in the sky? It's a bird. It's a plane. No, wait. It's an orange. We've all seen the giant orange balloon floating above Irvine. But where does it land, and why is it there? Well, it all starts in 1943 with the commission of the El Toro Air Force Base in Irvine. El Toro was primarily used as a training ground for new pilots, as well as a staging area for troops before they deployed overseas to fight in the Pacific Front. After the end of the Vietnam War, the air base was in little use and was eventually disbanded in 1999. Once the Air Force left, the city of Irvine had a large space to fill, and boy, was it large. Irvine soon developed the 4,639-acre piece of land into what is now the Orange County Great Park. The park features many unique attractions, such as the Farm and Food Lab, which provides visitors and children a chance to learn more about the farming and horticulture of Orange County. They have a chicken coop, as well as a few more curious creatures crittering around the farm. Another main attraction is the Carousel, which features hand-painted scenes of Orange County, 
as well as artwork inspired by vintage orange crates. The carousel reaches speeds of 4.5 miles per hour, is handicap accessible, and can carry up to 36 passengers at once. Across from which, visitors can also enjoy a free art gallery. Currently, the gallery is showcasing artist Mike Silkey's collection, where he uses stacked books as his canvas. Mike has had thousands of books donated to him over the years from various libraries, all of which he utilizes in his art pieces. Currently, over 40 of these pieces are on display here at the Great Park, available to view until April 10th. And of course, across from the hangar which serves as a memoir to the old base, is the famed Orange Balloon. Contrary to popular belief, it is not, in fact, a hot air balloon, but instead a massive 118-foot tethered helium balloon, the first ever of its kind in the United States. Under the balloon hangs a round enclosed cage which allows riders to safely float into the sky by simply stepping inside. Once loaded, the tether is unlocked and the balloon gently begins to rise silently into the air. Once the balloon is at its maximum height of 400 feet, riders can move around the circle to enjoy the full 360 degree view of Orange County. Rides typically last 10 minutes until the balloon is pulled back in for a perfect soft landing every time. If you're interested in a ride, swing by the Visitor Center to purchase your tickets and learn about the other events that may be happening at the park that day. Children under 18 and accompanied by an adult ride free. So if it's a sunny California day and you're wondering what to do, why not swing by the Orange County Great Park in Irvine and enjoy its rich history, unique attractions, and maybe leave your worries behind and go for a balloon ride. Getting to go to the park really was a lot of fun. Parking is free and balloon rides are only $10 per adult. Plus the art exhibit is free as well. It'd make for a great date or family day. I would highly recommend checking it out. And with that, it's time to wrap up this episode of The Scoop. I want to give a very special thank you to librarian Lydia Wellen and chef Randy Gubala for joining us in the studios. Congratulations to Zoe Carpenter for her film and good luck to our basketball team in the playoffs. I'm your host, Evan Anderson. I'll see you next week for another episode of The Scoop. Thanks for tuning in and have a great day. <laughs>